Good morning, everyone, and thank you for attending Like and Love, one of the last in Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiries Fall Dig into Nature virtual series. My name is Margot Rollins, and I'm a program coordinator with the Center. Until COVID-19 hit us, we would hold our programs such as this on our preserve, either on the Osborne Preserve in Pengrove on Sonoma Mountain or at our Galbraith Preserve near Yorkville in Mendocino County. And while we miss having people on the preserves, the Zoom format has allowed us to reach a larger, broader audience. We'd usually pass around a sign-in sheet now, but in lieu of that, can everyone please enter their name, full name into the chat box? Thank you. Before I let our presenter take it away, I wanna tell you just a little bit about the center and what and how you can be. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending Like and Love, one of the last in Sonoma State University's Center for Environmental Inquiries Fall Dig into Nature virtual series. My name is Margot Rollins, and I am a program coordinator with the center. Until COVID-19 hit us, our programs such as this were held on one of our preserves, either the Osborne Preserve on Sonoma Mountain in Pengrove, or the Galbraith Preserve near Yorkville in Mendocino County. And while we really miss having people on the preserves, the Zoom for format has allowed us to reach a larger, broader audience. We'd usually pass around a sign-in sheet about now, but in lieu of that, may I ask all of you to please put your name into the chat box so we'll know who's here. Thank you. Before I let our presenter take it away, I want to tell you just a little bit about the center and how we can be a resource to you, no matter if you're connected to the university or not. The center envisions a North Bay working together to find sustainable solutions. And we invite you to become environmentally ready with us. We're building a community of learners and problem solvers across all sectors of society by providing enhanced understanding of our vital connection with the environment and offering skill building experiences that lead toward these sustainable solutions. There are many ways you can get involved. You can be engaged in our research. You can take part in our naturalist training programs, attend events like these, access the myriad the data that we have on our websites, lead or contribute to events, partner with us on projects, and many more things probably that we haven't even thought of yet. Each of you is a critical element as we work together to address the greatest environmental challenges in history. Well, today we're gonna to talk about lichen, an important factor in our ecosystems that is a strong indicator of environmental health and hence potential degradation. Our leader is Jen Riddell. Jen is a plant biologist and lichenologist who lives in Mendocino County. She spent her graduate research days exploring what lichens can tell us about air quality in the urban montane and interfaces of Southern California. Her presentation will focus on what lichens are, their essential ecological roles, and basic ways to start to identify them as they are all around us. This is what we call a local nature format and Jen will present for about 30 minutes and then send us all out into our immediate neighborhood to look for a lichen specimen. Working with what she will have taught us, we will learn more about our particular species and its characteristics. Then we will have an informational Q&A session until the program finishes at 11 o'clock. Jen and I will stay on Zoom for another 15 minutes or so in order to continue to chat with you if you have things you want to talk about. I have muted you all and turned off your video. So if you have any issues such as you can't hear us or you need a clarification, put those into the chat box, which I will monitor. If you have questions of the general nature about lichens, save those or put them into the chat right away as you wish. And I will get, them, get to them as, as they seem like the right place in Jen's presentation. The presentation is being recorded and it will be posted on our website, cei.sonoma.edu slash calendar slash past events shortly. I will let you know via email when it is up and also be sending out a reference list that Jen would like you all to have. 
So with that, Jen, please take it away. Thank you. Um, yeah, so Marga gave me a really tall order when she asked me to give this talk online. Um, it sounds to me like life, the universe, and everything when you say introduce people to lichens and somehow we're all going to identify them. But um, it's really, uh, it's, for me, it really is actually about lichen love. And so what I'm going to try to do today is based on the fact that I see that there are everything from total beginners in the lichen world to people who are already environmental scientists and botanists is give a general overview that gives everybody a little bit of something. Hopefully that works. Um, and uh, share some of the love. So uh, I titled this Getting to Know Your Symbiotic Neighbors because really these guys are all around us. And uh, I really want everybody to walk away from this today feeling like they're starting to see lichens more clearly and they're popping out at you in the landscape. All right, so let's see if I can get this to move. Hmm. There we go. All right, first, the question I get from most people is, what the heck am I looking at? And in part, this is a problem of common names, right? So common names are super confusing. If you look at these three organisms on this screen, all of these things are called moss in common names. Right, so the one on the left is Spanish moss. This only grows in the southeast and the tropics. This is an air plant. It's a true vascular plant called Tillandsia, and it's not a moss, and it's not Spanish, um, and it's not a lichen. But you can see some of the similarities, right? It's draping off of a tree. This guy in the middle is an actual moss. So mosses are true plants and non-vascular. They tend to be small. They're generally always green or green brown, but they're plants. So they don't have a way to transport nutrients and there's a few differences between a moss and a tree, but it's a plant. Um, a lichen is a whole nother beast and we're gonna get into that shortly. But um, this one on the right is called Spanish moss. Another name for it, which is way more accurate is lace lichen and you can see why it's very lacy. This is our state lichen. It's found all the way from Southern Alaska down into Baja, California. And um, totally unique. You can always identify it as the only lichen that looks like this, but it's not a moss and it's not Spanish. So you can see because all of these things are called something similar, people get confused. So I wanted to just talk a little bit about what lichens are. When you're looking out in the landscape, they come in all kinds of shapes and colors. And lichenologists tend to call the, like they define these shapes as different things. So there's crustos lichens, like the one on the rock on the um, upper left. I don't know if you guys get the reversed, is yours reversed image or is it straight up what I'm seeing? What I see is on the upper left-hand corner, the one that's on the rock. Cool, okay, we're good. Um, so crustos lichens are really tightly oppressed. You can't really peel them off of things and you can't tell the, you know, you can't see a top or bottom on them. You just see the top. Powdery lichens, you often see these in uh, redwood forests or in strange kind of moist little wet places. Um, and it's basically, it looks like somebody ground up a bunch of flour and threw it on something, but it's usually a really cool color. But they're lichens. Um, they're shrubby lichens. You find a lot of these, they don't have a top or bottom. They look like a little shrub and they're the same color all the way around. Uh, leafy lichens have a top and bottom and they look a lot like a leaf. So, um, and they come in all kinds of colors and shapes, but they have a top and a bottom. And then you have things called squamulos lichens. And most of those around here are uh, cladonias. And I'll get a little bit into cladonias later, but just to give you a sense of like, when you're looking in the landscape, it's, um, it's not always obvious that these are the same thing, but they're all lichens. So what exactly is a lichen is the big question, right? How are these things all connected to each other and why are they the same group of organisms? So many of you know that the little, little rhyme that Alice Algae met Freddie Fungi and they took a lichen to each other and now their marriage is on the rocks. So that is the basic idea, right? It's a symbiotic relationship, at least one fungus, sometimes two, actually often two, and a photosynthetic partner. So a partner that can take carbon dioxide and light and form sugars. So a green algae or green alga or a cyanobacterium. We name the lichens for their fungal partners. 
and specifically for one of their fungal partners. So because that fungal partner really forms the shape of the lichen and dominates the life cycle. Another thing that's really important to know about lichens is their, this is my favorite science word, so remember this word, for at least for the presentation today, poikilohydric. So poikilohydric is a passive water regulator. So mosses are poikilohydric, right? Because they don't have vasculature, they can't transport stuff. And lichens are poikilohydric, meaning they only get their moisture from their surrounding environment. They, can't, they don't send down roots anywhere and control how much water is in their body. If it's wet, they absorb water. If it's foggy, they absorb water. Um, but when they're dry, they just basically shut everything down and they become inactive. So in the summertime in California, when we are in our drought season, most lichens are totally inactive unless they're right next to a stream or on a wet mossy bank. And when you look inside of this consortium, so if you take a cross section and you cut it really thin and you put it on a microscope, um, it's gonna look something like this. So on the top, you're gonna have what's called the upper cortex. It's a tightly woven uh, layer of fungal hyphae, so fungal threads that basically create a barrier between the inside and the outside of the lichen. So, um, you know, the outside would be the air around it, and this creates a barrier so that they control what's happening inside the lichen. The lower cortex basically does the same thing. Sometimes uh, it's just one cortex all the way around the lichen, especially on those shrubby lichens. In the center, you have loosely woven fungal threads, those fungal hyphae that create air pockets so the gas can be exchanged and it controls how much moisture gets to the photobiont layer. So the photobiont layer, that's the alga or the cyanobacterium that is able to photosynthesize. If anybody's confused, Margo, and they're sending up like little help me uh, notes, just let me know, raise your hand and just speak up. I'll let you know. Okay. okay, so moving on. So that's the basic structure of when you slice into it. If you do a scanning electron micrograph picture, basically like put them in a vacuum and bombard it with electrons and you look it up really close, you can actually see the structure of a lichen. And you can see here's the outer cortex on the outside. And then you have these loose medullar fungal threads or fungal hyphae in the center, creating those air pockets. And then you see these big balls and those are your photobionts. So this is your algal cell. This happens to be our lace lichen um, that I put into a, a really special microscope. Um, and you can see that structure. And if you look, oh, there's a little more. Um, so the fungus is basically, creating that structure and it's providing the nutrients in the water to the algal cells. Um, the algae or cyanobacteria are the photosynthetic part. They're producing those sugars. About 80% of those algal sugars are consumed by the fungus. Um, so basically both of them benefit because that house is created for the structures created for the, for the algae to live in and sometimes um, they're living in places that neither of those partners could live individually. So it really expands their habitat ranges. If you look even closer, you can kind of see, this is a cool photo, where you actually see the fungal threads going into the algal cells. So these big holes here are the algal cells. And this is a fungal thread coming in. It's like a little straw where it can suck out those sugars. So it's slowly consuming and killing the algal cells, but they can reproduce quickly enough that they constantly have a layer in there. So it's a little bit like the fungus is farming the algal cells, which is kind of cool. One of the cool things about lichens, just like everything in biology, is we don't know everything. We are far from learning everything about lichens. Um, about five years ago, the researcher up in Montana was doing genetic research on lichens and realized what we had always thought, which was that it was one fungus in each relationship was totally wrong, that we have both a cup fungus, an ascomycete, and a basidiomycete, which is what we think of as the mushrooms, um, in that same relationship. And we don't know exactly what roles they play. We know that the reproductive function is often the ascomycete, but we don't know how those two fungi interact with each other. Um, so we're still learning. We also know that 
There's more than 800 chemical compounds that lichens create. So they use some of them for sunblock, some of them to keep from getting eaten, and then some we just don't know. So there's lots and lots of stuff going on with these guys. So speaking of reproduction, there's a couple ways that fungi reproduce. One is through sexual reproduction. This is a little less effective. Um, so the idea is, and this is why we used to think that all of these were cup fungi, the astomycetes. Um, they produce these little cups on their surfaces. And inside, if you slice them open, you would see these little sacks full of spores. Now the problem, of course, and this is where it would be nice to be in person because we could answer these questions out loud, but if you're just sending out your spore and you are a symbiotic organism, basically you only work if you have all your partners in one place, those little spores have to land in just the right place and find just the right partners out in the world in order to grow a new lichen. So they do this um, and lots and lots of lichen or lichenized fungi produce these spores. Um, but sometimes it's more effective if you bring everybody with you. So a lot of times some of the coolest structures that you find on lichens are their asexual reproductive parts. So this guy up here on the left is Fistonia americana, a very cool little teeny lichen. And if you look very closely at these apothecia, which are these, cu these cups, around the edges you see what we call lobules. Um, if you look at the edge of this lobaria here, you'll see all these little lobules coming off of it. So they can break off very easily. They go out in the world, they land somewhere, and they grow a whole new lichen. Another way that lichens do it is they have ruptures in their surfaces, and they basically release little cotton candy bundles called ceridia of all of their partners wrapped up in one little bundle. So it looks like little powdery uh, flakes coming off into the world, but when they land somewhere, everybody's with them. Another little structure that you see are these finger-like projections on the surfaces. They're called ascidia. You do not have to memorize all these words. I just wanted to show you the cool things that they do to make these um, asexual reproductive parts. So, any questions that popped up yet, Margo, that were related to that? It seems to fit in here, but maybe you're going to get to it. From uh, Linda says, I'm curious about how lichens grow. Is it based on the reproduction of the algal cells? Um, basically, the fungus grows out and the algal cells are reproduced inside of that structure. Um, and the fungus controls the reproduction of the algal cells. I don't know if that answers the question. Um, oftentimes they grow very slowly. Um, sometimes uh, you can tell how old a uh, gravestone is in a churchyard by how big the fungus or the, the lichen is on it for some lichen species. Um, for our Ramelina and Menzizia, our state lichen, they can grow 20% of their biomass in a year in good conditions. So they grow very quickly. So it depends on the species. Linda said it, it did, did answer her question. There was one other question that I guess it could fit in here. Henry asks, uh, could you talk at some point about the findings concerning the involvement of a new kind of yeast? I don't know a lot about that, to be honest. Um, I know that, that that's where we were talking about those basidiomycetes. Um, well, maybe we can talk about that when we get to the Q&A, then maybe Henry has some information to share with us on that. Great. Okay, so those okay. are the only questions at this point. So. Another question that I get very often is based on the fact that you see these guys everywhere and oftentimes in orchards you see them covering really nice old orchard trees is are these lichens hurting my tree. Um, the short answer is no. The long answer is a little more complex and, and actually um, that you're probably um, helping your trees by having this biomass on them. So the first thing is remember that cool science word poikilohydric, right? They're passive water regulators, so they don't have roots. So they're not parasitic. They're not attaching themselves into the structure of your bark, and they're not sucking any nutrients out of your tree. Um, so they're just living on your tree. Your tree just happens to provide great habitat. Most orchard trees are 
deciduous, which means in the winter time, they don't have any leaves. So the lichens have a great place to grow without any competition from leaves. So they get wet and they hang out and they get lots of sunlight. If you look closely where they're growing, oftentimes they're growing in the most stable place they can. So on manzanita and madrone, they'll be growing on dead twigs. Um, they'll, they oftentimes enjoy the, the inside of pine bark and those little cracks where the, it's not gonna flake off. Um, so they're trying to grow in the most stable places they can and really they'll grow anywhere they can. The last thing is if you think about all that biomass, all of that sugar being fixed using carbon dioxide and sunlight, everything dies, they fall off, they land in the soil, and they become part of the nutrient cycling around your trees. So they're actually fertilizing your trees and bush, bush, bushes as they grow, right? Um, so in fact, you don't want to remove your lichens from your trees. They're doing a good thing for your, for your orchards. So that becomes the question is, where do they grow? Um, this is a picture I took on the north rim of the Grand Canyon. You can see that they are prolific on rocks in the desert. Um, we call lichens epiphytic when they're growing on plants. So you see them on trees and shrubs. And sometimes you even find them growing on leaves. So this is a picture I took down in Costa Rica where you can see there's a palm leaf that's absolutely covered with lichens and mosses and liverworts which we're not gonna go into. Um, really commonly around here, you find them popping on rocks in the winter time. So and when they get wet, they become more vibrant looking, especially when everything around them is dying for the winter. Um, so that's called saxicolis on rocks. You find them growing on soil. So this is a picture I took in Norway and you can see that up in the upper parts of the Arctic, the Lichens are just about as tall as the trees. Um, so the trees are about 12 inches tall and the lichens are about eight inches tall and there's a lot more lichen out there than there are trees. And if you look across that landscape, you can see that lichens are the dominant life form in certain parts of the Arctic. Super cool. In the desert, sometimes they're called vagrants or homeless lichens. This little guy is about a centimeter in total and it basically lives by rolling around. And when it's wet, it gets wet and starts being active. When it's dry, it just stays in its little ball and lives on the soil. And there's a few different vagrant lichens and they're all very cool. On rotting logs, so this is around here. Um, if you look closely at your logs in the winter, because those lichens are popping when they're wet, um, you can sometimes find them absolutely covered with these squamulose lichens with the pigs on them. Um, and these are all cladonias. So keep your eye open for cladonias. So the reason I wanted to talk to you guys about where you're gonna see them is because you're gonna go out and just find yourself a lichen to bring back and explore. Um, but I wanted to talk before we do that a little bit about a few more things. One is ecological importance of lichens. Um, so lichens are not just for humans um, and they're not just pretty. Um, I did a quick search for hummingbird nests and I found that most hummingbird nests that I saw images of are covered in lichens. So they're not entirely made up of lichens, but they're um, somehow they're camouflaging their nests with lichens and using them for some structure. Um, a few birds and actually I've seen some squirrel nests that include a little bit of lichen. Um, they are food for insects. So this cool little pincushion millipede is one lichen or one, one insect that eats lichens, but lots and lots of beetles and other insects eat lichens. Um, if in the, up in that Arctic, remember that giant picture where you have like entire valleys filled with lichens? The wintertime food of reindeers is lichens. And in fact, most of the lichens in the Arctic are called reindeer lichen. Around here, um, you'll oftentimes see deer browsing on those low hanging lichens draping off of the trees, especially when there's no other food available. So um, food for mammals, food for insects, nesting material. Um, so lots of animals use them for all kinds of things. They're biomass. If you look at this, like this is a lot of carbon being fixed out of the air and then added to the soil. Um, so that's a really important function of lichens. If you go to the desert, 
and you blow up the soil, you look really closely at it, desert soils are covered in lichens and mosses and bacteria and fungal hyphae, but this all holds that soil together and also fixes nitrogen, fixes carbon, and creates a stable soil crust. So when you talk, you hear people talk about biological soil crusts in the desert and how fragile they are, if you disturb this, these super slow growing organisms um, then are no longer holding things together and you start to get these dust storms and you lose that carbon storage. So it's something to consider when we talk about large utility scale um, solar arrays is looking at these soil crusts and that large disturbance that a large utility scale um, solar array can provide and then what the trade-off is. Um, and there's some studies that have shown that some of these utility scale solar arrays are actually carbon neutral rather than um, helping us reduce our carbon footprint. So it's interesting. It's a good question to ask ourselves is, um, you know, what, are, what is the value of these ecosystems and um, soil crusts in the, in the desert can actually be very important and significant. Okay, so when you're talking about this, a lot of times people say, can you eat it? Um, I've never tried. I've heard that they're basically starvation food. You can eat a lot of lichens. Um, sometimes you see pictures of people eating $300 meals in some fancy Scandinavian restaurant and there's lichens involved. Uh, <laughs> I've always thought it doesn't really look very tasty. I've tried to like, I've stuck lichens in my mouth and I've chewed on them. There's really not a lot of flavor. Um, there's probably some protein in them. Uh, but I provided you guys a link and I'm gonna, Margo, did you get a chance to send out that list of resources? No, I did not, Jen. Okay, we can do it afterwards, but I provided some links at the very end of the presentation um, and I provided a list to Margo. Um, so you can go and explore this on your own. There are some resources about what lichens you can eat, but it doesn't, I've, I've never been really that enticed because they, they aren't tasty. Um, lichens are super chemists. I'm not sure if I mentioned already, but lichens produce over 800 different chemical compounds. Um, so some of those compounds are really handy for dyes. And so you find people making these beautiful colors out of them. Um, and there's lots of online resources about what, what lichens make what dye and how you do it. Uh, for my research, it was actually um, one of the things that really drew me into lichens and doing more work with lichens. You can tell what your air quality is by looking at what your lichen community is made up of. Um, on the left hand side, I have some pictures of some large leafy lichens and shrubby lichens. Most of these lichens in these pictures on the left only grow in places where your air is clean. So if you see all of these lichens growing on your trees, you can feel fairly confident that the air you're breathing is pretty decent. If you go into a place where you're not seeing any of these and you only see these little lichens that you know are pollution tolerant or um, actually even like nitrogen pollution. Um, and there are definitely some that do really well and thrive in nitrogen rich environments. Um, then you might, then you can look at this comparatively and say this air quality may not be so good. Um, and oftentimes we back that up by having physical chemical uh, air quality monitors at sites. And we know that you can really predict general air quality trends looking at lichens. And that can be important when you're looking at you know, forest health and uh, human impacts and how winds move, et cetera. So it's a whole field of study and the Forest Service actually has quite a few lichenologists that work with the Forest Service and do air quality studies using lichens because it can actually be cheaper than trying to put out a physical monitor in a whole bunch of different places. Okay, so how are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. We're perfect. I wanted that to be a half an hour. You're fine. Um, so um, does anybody have any questions before we go into preparing for activities? Yes, there is one. Um, Christopher asks, if you're seeing both oligotrophic, oh, forget my pronunciation. Yeah, here we go. Oligotroph. Thank you. And eutrophication, <laughs> that's good air quality or medium if you see both? You can, some, so some, like, some lichens are um, okay with some pollution. Um, they're moderately tolerant of pollution. 
Um, when they disappear, you know things got bad. Um, generally speaking, you're going to find these eutrophs or nitrophytes, the, the lichens that are pollution tolerant, in all, in all places. You just don't see them covering all of the surfaces and you don't, um, so you know, in, in a clean environment, you'll still see the same lichens, just not as commonly. Um, and oftentimes you'll find those um, nitrogen loving lichens like the orange uh, xanthoparmelias and xanthomendozas, um, or xanthomendozas, not xanthoparmelias, but um, don't worry about names, sorry. Uh, you'll find them covering uh, fence posts uh, or places where birds hang out when they poop a lot. So fence posts uh, around corrals where you find you have livestock that are re, you know peeing a lot and re, producing a lot of um, urine that produces nitrogen that aerosolizes onto the boards and then the lichens really like that. Um, so it's not always a, you know like a broad trend. Sometimes it can be a little microclimate. Okay. That's what that was uh, the question. Yes. Okay. So. Common species that you're going to see out in the world by your house. And we're going to do a very short exercise because an hour is not a very long time. So you are probably around here going to see wolf lichens. And I know some of the um, places people said they were from were not Northern California, but wolf lichens are pretty common um, throughout Northern, uh, the Norm Northern Hemisphere. Um, this is Lotharia columbiana. And this is the only chartreuse lichen there is, and definitely don't eat it. This is the only one that I know of that is definitely toxic. Um, it used to be used to bait meats or to, to, um, to kill wolves, and they would bait uh, wolf traps with meat that they rubbed this lichen in along with broken glass. So we don't know if the glass killed them or the lichen did. Uh, but it's chartreuse and um, bright green and usually grows on dead things. If you live in a place that has a nice, beautiful, moist canyon, you might be seeing lung lichens. So I know Maricela, you have that at your house. I see Maricela on this call. Um, so lung lichens are low, uh, they're leafy lichens. So they're folios and they have a top and a bottom. And if you look at the bottom, it kind of looks like the inside of a lung. These guys have cyanobacterial partners and they fix nitrogen from the air and, and provide nitrogen in our ecosystems when they drop down and die. Here's another uh, Loberia. This guy's called speckle belly lichen. And if you look at the underside of it, it's got all these little dots where the lower cortex is punctured. Um, it looks very brown and boring when it's not wet. So it's perfect that we recently had a rain around here. But when it's wet, it kind of greens up a little bit. So it's a green brown and they can get quite big and they covered with, they're covered with these beautiful kind of orange-brown apothecia, those little cups that produce spores. Um, if you look on the ground on a bank, like a, a mossy bank, um, as soon as it gets wet, you'll see these guys start to un uncurl. Normally when they're dry, they look like a little dead leaf. When they're wet, they kind of uncurl and you open up into have the, uh, these, these giant rosettes. These are called dog lichens or pelt lichens. And you can see the underside is usually kind of fluffy and white. There's no real lower cortex. These are another nitrogen fixing lichen. Um, so Peltidra is very easy to recognize because they're the, that rosette on the ground. Something you'll find on big trees or you know like oak, oak trees and ash trees is these speckled green shield lichens. It's basically a giant kind of yellow green rosette of lichen material growing around on your bark. Um, you'll find them on branches a little smaller, but this is also a really cool one. It's a Latin name, Flavo punctilia flaventio, or scientific name. Um, that punctilia refers to the fact that when you look a little closely at the surface of it, you'll see all these little punctures on the surface of your lichen. Here's another common and really easy to identify genus, so a group of lichens. These guys are called tube lichens, and if you pull them open, you'll find that they're tubular inside. And they often grow in places uh, that are a little shadier and they often grow on conifers. But you'll also find them on oak branches and on manzanitas and the drones. So very cool, super easy to identify because they're hollow inside, so they're tubular. Rock tripe is another super cool one. It looks very ugly until you get close to it. It's this little brown, Thing that's got a central hold fast onto a rock. 
But when you look really closely at its um, apothecia, its little spore cups, they look like coral, little brains. Super common on our rocks around here. So very easy one to like pick up and start to identify. I know I'm going very fast, but um, we can revisit these later. So usnias, we have lots and lots of usnia species around here. All of them, when they're wet, you can peel aside their outer cortex. And if you look at this lower picture on the left, you can see a central white cord in the center that when it's wet, it's stretchy and rubbery. Only usnias have this, so you can really easily pick out usnias. If it's got a big sun cup on it, it's usnia intermedia. So this one's a cool, easy one to pick up, and it's super common in Northern California and especially common in oak woodlands. Hammered shield lichen, or Parmelia sulcata, is another one that's super common around here. And it looks like someone literally took a hammer to it. It's got a black underside with these straight little things called rhizines. And the upper side is kind of a gray green color. Um, and it looks like it got hammered. So another one that you can just kind of pick out with your eyes sometimes. Um, I just have a couple more I'm going to give you guys and then I'm going to send you out in the world. Oak moss, so the Avernia prudastri. Um, this looks like a shrubby lichen, but it's actually pale, pale green on one side and a pale white on the bottom side. Um, this is a moderately pollution tolerant lichen, so you can find it kind of in a huge array of places throughout um, Northern California all the way um, down to Southern California and up into Oregon, Washington, Alaska, etc. And then Something that should be popping out at you if you live near a forest is your cladonias. These are those weird little squamulus lichens again, but anything that has a peg and a cup on it, or even a little red ball on the top, is a cladonia. So it's really easy to get to genus on that. Very hard to get to species because you have to do chemical analyses sometimes. But very, very, very cool. I love seeing these guys because they're always growing in uh, you know, unique little places and they always have a unique look. And then your powdery lichen. So I mentioned these in the very beginning, but if you live in a redwood forest and you can see that sheen of green sometimes on the lower part of a redwood tree. So these guys are easy to spot and kind of fun. And then don't forget your crustose lichens. They're not always gray or brown. Sometimes they're bright, bright yellow or orange, but they're always oppressed to their surface. And you can find them on trees, on rocks and on soil. Okay, just one last thing before you go out. Um, you don't have to have a hand lens, but it sure makes it easier to see lichens. Lichens are small. If you don't know how to use a hand lens, but you have one, you hold it up to your eye, and then you adjust what you're looking at in and out until you are in focus. If you don't have a hand lens, you can use your phone. Take a macro picture and then zoom in on whatever you are trying to see. And you can actually see some very cool features on your lichen. So um, take your phone with you if you can't pack, pack your lichen, or if you can't bring your lichen back, take your phone with you and take pictures. Um, and then what you're gonna do is you're gonna be looking on tree bark, branches. If anybody lives in the middle of a city, you can look on old bricks. Um, if you live next to an old junkyard, Sometimes you find things on old cars. Um, you can look in your soil on um, old fence posts or corral boards. Basically just kind of keep your eyes around you. And this, the exercise's purpose is not just to have you bring something back, but also just to have you start to see things. So go ahead and what time are we at now? 10.40. Um, yeah, let's so take 10 minutes. 10 minutes, be back here in 10 minutes. I'm gonna stay online. So if anybody wants to stick around and ask questions, I can just do that. Um, and then bring your lichen back and we'll spend a few minutes looking at your lichens. Obviously there's enough people on this call that we can't look at every single one, um, but we can try to answer a few questions and then uh, we'll move on to Q and A. So, all right. So see everybody at 10.50. Yep, sounds good. Is there a, um, if somebody's interested in, is, is, is this something that iNaturalist keeps track of if people are trying to engage with 
citizen science around lichen? Yeah, I actually have. Uh, let me let me go and look. Um, is this little box here? Let me deal with this little box. Um, I pulled up my naturalist. Um, let's see. Yeah. I think lichen get categorized in the fungi world, but there are many, many lichen observations on my naturalist. So they'll actually help you try to get the species. Can you still, oh, wait. Can you see my screen? Um, can you see the iNaturalist screen? No. Or do I have to I'm, stop I'm, sharing I'm, and reshare? I'm still seeing your, there you, okay, now you're, you just need to go into a different window. Let's go here. Um, yeah, so if you go to iNaturalist, um, that's probably the best place for citizen science for lichens. Uh, okay. There might be others that I don't know about. Um, you but, might mention that when people come back. Yes, I've got it in the resources. Oh, good. Okay. I'm I sorry. Well, it'll, I'll send it out when I send out the email about the recording. No worries. We got this. Did anybody stick around and how, do they have questions? I would imagine some people did because I gave them the option of you know, going ahead. When I sent them out the email, mm -hmm. said, you know, go ahead if you want to bring something back. And, uh, hey, Margo <clears throat> and Jen, I have a photo of a lichen. How do I... Put that in the chat so people can see that. Um, Is there a way to do that? I don't know if there's, I don't think there's a way to do it in the chat, Andy. Um, or how do I share? You'd have to share your screen, Andy. Yeah, I think so. Do we trust Andy? <laughs> I don't uh, know how many people. Hold on I a minute. See it bring up this. I think it's what you were calling a, a dog lichen, but I'm not sure. Was it on soil? No rock. Ooh, Jim Gibson found a way to do it. He took, he basically made it his profile photo. Oh, oh. how do I do that? Oh. Let's see. That was clever. I can't see that. Can you see it? Yeah. The Jim Gibson. I see a chat from him. That's, he, uh... If you look at his picture, instead of a video, it's it's a picture of his light. Oh, no. I have two cameras. Oh, uh, got it. Okay. And this is a little hummingbird nest. Oh, sweet. Where did you find it? Um, actually, my wife found it um, at one point on the ground, I guess, outside. It used to be when it was when it was new, you could really see the lichens very well. And I'm sorry, mm -hmm. the camera's not very good. I was really trying to find another camera to use, but I haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, it's this is a limit of our technology, but it looks like on the plate you might have um, some kind of hypogymnia. Is it hollow? Well, it's you know, uh, God, I, I actually uh, do you know who Teresa Schollers is? Yeah. Okay. Well, she actually identified this for me, and I can't remember what it is. But this was like like almost wrapped around a piece of branch, so uh -huh. it, it's a big continuous piece of lichen, and it has. So if you can pull off one of the little branches and look and see if it's hollow, that'll tell you. I mean, the, the focus isn't great, but my I guess know. is if it's hollow, it's hypogymnia enteromorpha. Yeah, well, actually, I may have put it up on uh, iNaturalist, but let's see what happens here. Um, yeah, Margo, can we just have people dry. put their camera on when they want to show pictures? Yeah, I think we can do that. Yeah. Actually, let me go look and see what I've got. I think I have it listed on I yeah, While he's doing that, Andy, do you want to show us yours? I'm still trying to put it on the <laughs> my profile picture. Just turn, just turn on your video. Yeah, just turn on your video and hold it up. Yeah, you can do that, Andy. Well, it, unfortunately, it's a, a, a photo I have uh. on the preserve. Uh. Um. Oh, trying. cool. So I see a few people have them. Well, Andy, we can we can hang out a little oh. bit too and, and figure sure. it out. Sure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share screen a little bit too with a few questions that you can ask yourself about your lichen. Um, and then I'll also try and look at people's photos as they are coming up. 
I brought a bunch. I've been collecting them this week, so. <laughs> yeah, can you see? This is Mila. Can you see a little plate? No. I see you, Mila, but not your plate. So if I go, can you see that? Hold no. no. We still see you. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So let's see. So here's a couple of things I want you guys to start with, because we can try and look at a few individuals, um, but there won't be time to see everybody's. Right. So first, I want you guys to ask yourself, why do you think what you have is a lichen? So does anybody have any comments on that? That's the description. <laughs> yeah. They're on the trees. They're on, they're on the, they've, they've got, yeah. There's one little piece here that I've got several lichens on, different ones. And it's not a moss because? Well, I know what a moss looks like, and this isn't a moss. This is like. It's a lichen. <laughs> a gestalt, that, that just a general sense of it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's it's, it's like. A bunch. Knowing when you look at your friend, you know who your friend is. This is a lichen. <laughs> okay. So what shape are your lichens? Are they folios, like so leaf-like, or are they crusty? Are they shrubby? This is all part of what you're going to ask yourself if you ever want to identify your lichen. Uh... If everybody would like to unmute themselves to to join in the chat here, we, we we can do that. I cannot unmute you all. You have to do it yourself, and you are able to do so. Um, can you see this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you have several things going on there. Yeah, well, this is it. There's, there's something that looks leafy and, and crusty. And then there's the other shaggy type thing that sort of falls well, like shrubby. It's not too shaggy, but it looks like it's growing outward, and then it's got a little puff on the other side too. But it is yeah. it is pretty stiff, and that's pretty common that you're going to find ten species of lichen in about twelve inches of branch. Well, this um, one, which is one of the cool things about lichens. This was on the uh, we trimmed off a little piece of our plum, a, a little branch of our plum tree. And this happened to have several on it, or at least, at least two. Yeah, and then so probably a remolina, and I can't tell what else. And then um, we had this one just on from the oak, probably it was on the grounds. We have a, a Quercus agrifolia. So we right, have. And one of the cool things about the coast live oak is you find very few lichens, except on the very tips of the branches because they're evergreens, right? So you're not going to find lichens on the interior. Yeah, well, this was this was actually I took off the oak tree, so we have quite mm -hmm. a few lichen on our oak. So this is the one that was directly on the oak, attached to it and growing. Mm -hmm. So we're in a in a region where we seem to have quite a variety of 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 lichens. And we're very pleased about that. That's oh, great. Lord, Deb, I can tell that you also live in a place that's a little bit wet. You have some really wet, nice wet lichens. This one? Um, where yeah, is that, that looks like an usmia to me, is it? Did you find a central cord? This one's pretty dry right now. You just stick it in your mouth and get it wet. No one's going to know. <laughs> um, so the other thing you, you should be looking at is, do you see those apothecia, those asex, asex, or the sexual cups where you produce spores, or do you see the other things like the little fingers or lobules? Those are going to be questions you'd see when you were trying to identify the your lichen. What color is it? How would you describe the color? Um, a few of you brought up where your, where your uh, lichens were growing. So on the tips of branches, are they on the soil? So Andy found his pelt lichen on the soil. Um, so all of those are going to be things that help you identify what you have. And there are thousands of species of lichens. And yep. the nice thing is lichens are pretty broadly distributed. There's not a lot of lichens that are only found in one place because those spores can travel quite, and those, those asexual reproductive parts can travel quite a long ways because they're so small. This so they get picked up by the wind and off they go. We found spores in the air at 20,000 feet when you do um, overflights with uh, airplanes. There are a couple of questions, Jen, in the chat. Yeah. 
that were uh, more of a general nature, Mike asks, is bitter lichen a type of powdery lichen? I don't know what bitter lichen is. That's a good question. <laughs> Are you still there, Mike? Can you, you, you can clarify in, in person if you'd like. Uh, yes, uh, I, I think I'm here. You are here. Uh, Thank you. I see you. Yeah, usually it's uh, I find it growing on uh, on oak trees. I think, and and it's uh, it's more. It looks like almost a wash, a white wash on on the tree. And if you uh, take a little taste of it, it's very bitter. Wow. Oh. I have to say, I haven't tasted too many lichens. Um, this is. But it, it could be, um, it sounds like it might be a crustose lichen that's pretty common on trees. And oftentimes, if you get really close with your hand lens, you'll find that you can see really cool little cream colored cups on them. Those, those are the apothecia. So I don't know what you have. It could be lepraria. It could be a few other species that are really common on bark. Well, yeah, sound, from what you're saying though, Mike, it doesn't sound like it's a powdery lichen. It's not really powdery, but that's the closest. It's very, uh, there's no, at least if you look at it without uh, a microscope or a, a magnifying glass, it's, uh, it, it's, it's just almost a coating. But it's always people, you know, will, it will give a hike and they'll say, try this. And I've tried it before and it's very bitter. Oh, Doesn't Mike? hurt you. Is it like this guy here? This is from an oak bark. I don't know if you can see it. Yeah. No, it's it's very smooth almost. Yeah, not the not the the dangly bits, but the the white. Oh yeah, yeah. It'd be something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I have some too. Let's see if I can. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, Jen. The... Yeah. The plate lichen, uh, it was uh, Hypogymnia occidentalis. That's what Teresa said it was. Oh, okay. Um, that makes sense. So it was a okay. tube lichen, and she called it occidentalis. And from here, I really couldn't get you to species. Right. Yeah. No, I I, I realized that. And but yeah, but you found like that tube, that tubular. Yeah, that was found in the forest. I found it in Jackson Jackson Demonstration State Forest. It does look like just looking at your lichens, it looks like you live on the coast. I do. Um, I'm actually yes. right. I'm not too far from the ocean, right where I am now. But uh, that was found out in the forest when we were doing mushrooming out there. Okay. Well, it's 10:53 right now. I wanted to just run through a couple of resources for you guys, so that you um, and, and these are the ones what we're going to send out to you, um, so you don't have to write everything down. But just to so you know that, like, this is a taste of looking into lichens. Lichens are it's a lifetime activity, and so. One hour is not going to um, make you an expert, and I can't answer all of your questions this time. So there are some great books, and there's a few that are really good for California. Um, Macro Lichens of the Pacific Northwest is got some really great keys. Um, if you're into keying lichens, but it also has great pictures, um, and that is uh, produced out of the Pacific Northwest at, at Oregon State, but still really relevant for our area. Um, Lichens of North America, if you can find it in print, it's expensive, but it is an absolutely fabulous book. Um, it's basically like, you know, coffee table size, but he's tried to do as much as he can to really help people get uh, a picture of most of the lichen genera around here. Um, the California guide, the field guide to lichens is just pictures and um, descriptions, but the person that did it is a phenomenal photographer, Stephen Sharnoff, really worth looking at. Lichen biology is for those of you who want to get super nerdy um, and really get into the chemistry and understanding the biology of lichens. And then if you want just a little like California primer, you could like get the $15 um, mini guide to lichens of California. And that's, you can get from the California Lichen Society. So again, we're going to send this out to you. Um, yep, I will do that. I don't have to describe each of these websites, but I wanted to tell you that there, I made links to a bunch of different things like I said, there's some great lichenologists that work for the Forest Service and they've made phenomenal pay web pages with good information on them. Um, Oregon State University has this wonderful lichenologist working there, Bruce McCune, and he produced a pretty cute website with also some really great in-depth information. The California Lichen Society does lichen walks around California and has information about California lichens and produces a journal of California lichens. 
Um, ABLS is the American Bryological, so they cover mosses and liverworts and lichens. Um, they have a journal that tends to be more academic, but really interesting if you're super into this. There are some free downloadable keys, but I prefer the books. They have good pictures and they can help. You can do gorilla keying by just flipping through them and finding the things that you want. And then um, for those of you that aren't on iNaturalist, although I suspect most of you guys are, iNaturalist is a really great app to have on your phone. So you can take a picture of something and it can actually help you try to get to the group that you're wanting to identify. So it might even help you get, it might tell you you have a species, but oftentimes you want to double check that. So that, and then also there are some really cool videos out there. And I just listed a few of them um, with some like that did some stuff with National Geographic or Science Friday, or just have some videos of their walks. So Pat Wolseley is a wonderful London uh, a British lichenologist who does walks and talks about air quality with lichens with her students. Um, and then the lichen song. We can, we can end, just end on the lichen song. And I think that's all the resources I wanted to give you guys. So we could just finish a by- few more questions, A couple of questions here yeah. that I didn't, didn't raise to you yet. Um, Willie asks, is it true that pouring buttermilk on rocks will encourage lichen growth? I've never tried that. Um, I've never, I've heard of people trying to fertilize lichens, but um, if the conditions are right for lichens, they'll just grow. Um, don't water your lichens in the middle of the summer heat because that might actually stress them out. Mm -hmm. Pouring buttermilk, I, I would imagine that if it had beneficial qualities that you might want to really dilute it. Um, but I don't know. Or maybe Willie really could test it for us and let us know. Yeah. Uh, Leslie asks, do the old dried up lichens under our oak tree come to life again when I make them wet? Maybe. If they have fallen to the ground, um, you could potentially hang them somewhere else. But if they're once they're on the ground, if they were growing on the trees, they're just going to start to biodegrade, which is a good thing for the oak. The oak wants those nutrients. Um, but you could probably hang it on something else and it might survive and thrive. Um, it probably just fell off. It's still alive. And Jim mentions the Lichens of California project that people can join on iNaturalist. Yes, mm -hmm. iNaturalist is fabulous. And I think a really great citizen science project yeah, where you can- project, I guess there. Yes. And then uh, Ross has a friend of hers, uh, Ralph Pope wrote Lichens Above Tree Line, a hiker's guide to Alpine zone lichens of the Northeastern United States. We can add that. Um, to the list of resources for people to, when I send yeah. out that email. I didn't include lichen books for other places, but there are some great lichen books for all over the country and all over the world. Um, there's just too many to, to list in one place, but um, yeah, there's some soil lichen guides there. You know, you could, you could go endlessly nerdy. Yeah. Uh, Jen, before I let you get to the song, I have a, just a wrap up, just a, a second here that I wanted to just uh, tell people before people all sign off. Um, thank you all for, for being here today. I hope you learned a lot. It certainly was a great deal of information that Jen, Jen gave us. Um, and I want to tell you there are two more events coming up in our virtual Dig Into Nature Falls series. One is on assistive photography tools to help people with challenges take their photography into nature. The other is a winter writing walk with Lakin Khan, who's a former SSU English department lecturer. So you can check those out on our website, cei.sonoma.edu forward slash calendar and register for those. And we are in the process of putting together our next series for the spring and even looking into the fall. So let us know if there's something you would like to hear about or if there's something you'd be interested in leading. We will be very happy to talk to you about. You should have my email in all the different communications and you'll get it again when I let you know about the recording when it's up. So Jen, you want to take us out with the song? Sure, and I just wanted to mention, I didn't include my email address on the information, but we can include that when we send out a note and okay. anybody can feel free to email me if they have further questions. Thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, I can take us out with the song, but if anybody wants to hang out, I'll just put like the song on for 30 seconds. And if anybody wants to hang out and ask more questions or show me more lichens that they want to help, help identifying, yep. you can do Please that. Please stay around if you'd like.
All right, let's see. I think I got to stop share and then reshare. Okay, let's go here. All right, this is just dorky and fun, so um, I'll just do 30 seconds. Once there was a fungus, Freddy was his name. Oh, sorry. Brush your teeth no. in less than 10 seconds <laughs> with this revolutionary toothbrush. It was created. There we go. Love Zoom. There's no love for me among us. All these fungi look the same. So he took himself a cordon down to where the green things grow. Met some algae name of Alice. She set his heart aglow. Well, Freddy Fungus and Alice Algae took a liking to each other. They grew so very close. And now you can't tell one from t'other. Them likings lead a simple life. They never are alone. Does the cooking and Freddie builds the home. So my husband pointed out that was a little outdated, and we could probably say like Frederica and Albert. But um, anyways, there when I looked up lichen songs, this is when this is when I knew, but um there are actually lichen raps and all kinds of cool lichen songs out there, so it's worth digging around if you <laughs> if you have the nerdy interest. Um I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that if anybody wants to show anything, um, they can if just hold it up to your um, camera and we can try and dig around. Or if anybody has other questions that we didn't get to. I think I gave you all the questions that were here. But... Mm -hmm. well, I wanted to say thank you, Jen, and I also wanted to recommend uh, getting out in your in your yard and taking photographs of your lichens and putting making making a book out of them and uh, just having them so that you can look at them through the years because I, I feel like that's really helped me is to photograph all the lichens that I see here and then have them as closely identified even if it's just a genus so mm -hmm. that even in the summertime I take this little book out and I look at the pictures and I try to keep the names in my head. Nancy Kelly asks a question. She says, there's fungus and algae plus something else, right? So yes. So there's at least the, there's two species of fungus typically. And then there's an alga, usually one algal species, but sometimes you also have a cyanobacteria and sometimes you just have a cyanobacterium. I found that when you look really closely at the surfaces of lichens, they're covered in bacteria and pollen and all kinds of weird stuff that they pick up. So there's a lot more going on than just Alice, algae, and Freddy fungi. <laughs> Great, thanks for that, Nancy. If you want, you, can can you unmute yourself if, if you'd like to ask a question? And it looks like everybody's yeah, uh, right. I was just curious as to uh, what this, this is a very lacy looking thing that's growing all over Japanese plum and uh, crab apple trees in my yard and not at all on the elm trees. Can you, you have your camera on? Video on. Yeah. Oh, turn the video on, sorry. Uh, Can you do yep. that? There you go. And then hold it, oh, you're in right. and out. There we go. Okay. Let's see, back to camera. There we go. Just wonder if you have any thoughts. You still can't see it. See it, Bruce. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, I'm sorry. No. But I see I the person with Leslie's name is holding up a lichen. What do you have there? We can wait, Bruce. You keep working on this, and we'll look at um, right. look at this one. Hmm. Now you your, camera your now. camera's on now, and we see your hand. Yep, we see your hand. So now it, the lichen just has to go in there. Right. Let's see. There we go. Ah, that, Mike, that looks like you have a some kind of ramelina. Is it shiny and green on all sides? Yes, dull and green. Yeah, so probably a ramelina. Hmm. And then Bruce, let's see. I would guess 
if there's a little bit of white on one side of your lichen that you have, you probably have a few things there, uh, but you might have some Avernia, that oak moss. And then it looks like you may, it's so hard to tell with the focus, um, but you probably have an Usnea. So try to see if you can find that central cortex. If your lichens are wet, see if there is a central cord in the middle. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. Is Bruna. You mentioned the fact that lichens produce Lord knows how many types of chemicals. That mm -hmm. takes a lot of energy. What are are there any purposes that you can list off for the sure, besides us making pretty dyes? Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> what is well, so some of it is sunblock, right? If they're growing <laughs> awesome. Ruby's got the book. I think I saw that when I was looking for it. Um, so what, who's the author on that? Who are you asking? What are you looking oh, at? Ruby's holding up a book about dyes. Um, so, um, Isenkron? Yeah. Um, so. Ruby, oh, unmute and talk. Yeah. Um, so they. Sorry, they I just, just have one hand. Ah. Uh, Karen Diadic Castleman is the author to this Like and Dyes book. Very cool. Yeah. Um, really. Thank you. So they produce the sunblock. So some of those um, are, some of them are antioxidants so that they can protect their cells from too much UV light. Um, some of it is anti herbivory. If they make themselves bitter, then animals won't want to eat them. Um, Sometimes they make these compounds that basically allow them to attach extra nitrogen to them. So those lichens that survive really well in nitrogen rich environments um, basically create carbon skeletons that they can attach nitrogens to so they don't basically toxify the lichen. Um, and then, you know, fungi, think about it like fungi in general produce a lot of different chemical compounds. Fungi are chemical specialists. Um, so we don't know what a lot of those compounds are for but a lot of them are just protection, basic protection. And, and the, the, the dye products are, are achieved by, by the, taking apart the, fu the fungi? Is it basically, it I mean, you have- Ruby knows, but um, until you got yourself on, yeah, there you go. Um, so, um, so yeah, so when you're dying with uh, lichens, or mushrooms. I've done it with mushrooms before, but not with lichens quite yet. I just got this book. So basically you're drying out the, the lichen and then you're boiling it in water to make a dye like solution. And then you add your material like wool or silk or whatever. And then you simmer that for another hour. Or so it, that's a basic premise as, as far as I know. Oh, thanks. I've seen them just soaked in cold water too. produce those pigments. You can um, so. make it like sun tea, kind of. Because I've, yeah. seen, I've seen the mushrooms when they've reached the point where they're almost disintegrating and they're bleeding. And that's what's used for also for dying. Mm -hmm. for yeah, some, some mushrooms will look like that before you even uh, uh, do that process to them. But um, yeah, you're, you're correct there. I was sort yeah. of surprised we had this Belitis and I was looking at it and, and uh, someone, a mycologist I was speaking to, he says, well, cut it and I have to look on the other uh, underside of it to see, to be able to really zero in on the species. And I said, it's so pretty, I don't really want to cut it yet. It's growing and all the rest of it, the cat's gorgeous. But when I did turn it upside down and cut, you know, I had it cut, it was bleeding this ooze that was coming out of it was unbelievable. Absolute ooze. And it sometimes some of the compounds these organisms are producing are actually chemical warfare, right? So they want to compete with other organisms. They want to dominate their space that they're living in. You sometimes see lichens trying to overgrow mosses and they'll just kind of grow on top of them and pr produce chemicals that help them like outcompete those mosses or kill the mosses. Sometimes they're producing acids that help take, break down rocks so that they can get a better hold fast. Um, so there's tons of reasons why you might want to have chemicals handy, right? Right. You're not going to take it out of a can. You're going to have to produce it. Right. <laughs> are, there, are there other questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, what, what is... 
what do lichens, do they recover from wildfires? Yes and no. So there's actually some research now going on about like sort of the size and scope of a fire and how that impacts lichen recovery. Um, a mild fire, not a problem. So if you look, think about controlled burns or, or prescribed burns where they're low intensity, low heat, and they're spotty, not a problem. When you have these really large fires that are super high heat and kill most of the vegetation around, that's when there's, you know, like they need to be able to reproduce and get their materials out there and they need to grow on things. Um, so it depends on the intensity of fires. And does it make um, then the forest, if it's covered in lichen, does it actually create a, a hotter fire for the forest? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I would think that it's more important kind of how many, like how, what your shrub ratio is in the forest and uh, kind of your fuel loading for other things. Um, I would think that lichens and mosses burn like a flash. And so they'll burn hot and fast, but it'll be like low intensity in terms of yeah. like adding to the overall heat. They're not like, it's not like when you get a whole tree on fire that adds a lot of heat to your fires. Right. So I'm not sure. They might be good kindling, but not like something that's gonna sustain a big fire. It's maybe more like a grass fire or something. But are certain lichens associated with certain trees, like certain mushrooms or a certain associated with oaks or with pines or whatever? Are lichens, they, do they do the same thing? Are they associated with certain? Probably more with different yeah. habitats. So if you're looking at the habitat that you're in, that's gonna be more likely influencing um, what kind of lichens you're seeing. Are you in a wet canyon? You're gonna have some of those lichens that really like wet atmospheres. Um, are you, what's your solar exposure? Um, so I, we talked a little bit about live oak trees versus deciduous oak trees. You'll find a lot more lichens growing on deciduous oak trees than you would on um, the live oaks because they get more sunshine in the winter. So they're active when it's wet. And so they want sunshine when it's wet. So I think that that's more important than the species of tree that it's growing on. Oh. Um, sometimes you'll find like certain rocks have certain chemical um, makeups and they might be more basic or acidic and that might influence what kinds of lichens you have growing on them. If that makes sense. Yes, it does. Yeah, we but we have in San Pedro Valley Park and even here we have a lot of evergreen oaks and some of them are just literally bearded if that's the correct term for it. The lichens are just hanging down and Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, so you're a little further, let's see, are you closer to the coast than us? Uh, probably, I mean, we're only a mile and a half in from the ocean. Yes. In, so in you get a lot of fog and that makes a big difference too. So yeah. fog is just enough moisture to get those lichens going. And so once they're going, then they're productive. If you go a little further inland or in a place where you don't get fog, um, then those lichens are going to be adapted to drier conditions and less robust and less luscious. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, that's interesting, Jen. I was thinking about the, the ash in the valley, in the Willits Valley, and how they have that ramelina and that other, that darker one that's, um, oh, I forget what that's called, mm -hmm. but it's almost black and brown that hangs down. And there's a lot of valley fog out there. So that would make sense because otherwise... Yes. It's hot and dry in the summer, but it has a lot of moisture out there. There is a lot of moisture. You, yeah, along the coast, Ramelina grows a lot faster, but in our inland valleys that get that summer fog, mm -hmm. our Ramelina can be really robust. So along yeah. the rivers and along the like the valley corridors. Yeah, let's see if I can remember the name but, of that. But after after fires and so on, which was brought up, the question of fires and the fact that you know they're they get burnt with the biomass. Um, and a lot of vegetation is usually destroyed if the fire is very hot, then the lichens turn into, pri into, into the first primary succession in terms of creating life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if there's um, a way for them to get there, um, then yes. So some lichens only reproduce by breaking off parts of themselves. So some lichens are actually old growth dependent. 
um, like the usnea longissima is a, a, an usnea that just has these, you know, meter long strands. And the only way it reproduces is to break off and blow to another tree and grow. Mm. Um, so that one we found doesn't really travel outside of old growth very well. Other lichens that reproduce by tiny spores and soralia, they are going to be quicker to come in and mosses too. If the fire's not too intense, mosses are going to be the first thing there. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mosses first and lichen second. Yeah, probably the same time, but the mosses are going to grow faster. Wow. Okay. If that makes sense. No, I mean, one's a faster grower than the other. That's fine. <laughs> so they'll get there at the same time, but they need the right conditions to grow. So that other species. More... I'm sorry, sorry, go ahead. That other species is called Bryoria. I, I are we supposed to remember the bryoria that grows oh in yeah that's another one of those robust hanging moss yeah. or lichens sorry now i'm going to start doing that um, <laughs> yeah. what do you have i don't know um, and yeah. if i may ask one more question i seem to have a whole heap of them coming out of my head the thing is is that when you're up in the sierra nevada and so on where you have a lot of snow they usually say something to the effect that uh the moss grows on the side of the tree that the north side. The north side? I've heard that a lot. Is and there any the moss you? grows on the wet side of a tree? Mm -hmm. um, and that is not always the north side. Um, if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's going to be the south side. Um, but also, if you're in a canyon, it's going to be all sides. Um, so um, that's not something I would rely on for navigation if you're lost. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. It's going to grow on the shady side of the tree. Yeah, yeah. yeah definitely is. Yeah. All right. Any other questions or <laughs> let, Jim, let Jim go? Or <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to hang out as long as people have questions. But I have something what I was intrigued by. I don't know whether you can see that here. I found a piece of oak and uh, I like to take pictures. And uh, when I picked it up, I realized, boy, there's so many different types of yeah. uh, creatures on there that you I was see all... at least five or six lichens. Yeah, right, exactly. And I yeah. was all surprised. And I, when I go walk around in nature, I just take pictures or whatever I find interesting. And I found these little creatures very interesting. And so I didn't know anything about lichen, but I think I'll now go into microphotography and take more pictures of those guys because they are so intriguing in forms and shape. Uh, I'm mind blown, I must say. Thanks Super for charismatic. Less, yeah. yeah, right. And I got the um, lens there, for it too. <laughs> one, of, one of the links I put up on the resources that I'll send out is actually an interview with somebody who got into lichen photography and he talks about some of his methods. So that might be enjoyable for you. Yeah, uh, what was that book uh, that had the best pictures with photography about lichen? Well, yeah, the one that Maricela is holding up, the Lichens of California or California Lichens. Oh, okay, that's what Even I Even is a phenomenal photographer. Yeah. yeah, awesome, awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. And right we there. have a friend, acquaintance, who actually paints lichens, and mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, she, did, she did some of the Marin... Uh, she lives in Marin, and the paintings in watercolor are just absolutely mind-boggling. They're hard. It's hard to think about how to represent a lichen because it's kind of this blob of like. But <laughs> yeah, on one of them, she has at least five or six different ones on this one piece of wood, uh, and it's just the 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 precision, the 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 fact that they're so small. And you see her work, and it's like it, it just blows your mind. Absolutely blows your mind. Yeah, they are amazing. Any other questions? I see a few people have hung out, and I'm not sure if you're being shy or just listening in. Um, just listening in at the moment. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, um, Andy, still, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I said we, we still have 16 Thank people. Very much. That was awesome. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Very good. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. <laughs> all right. Shall we wrap up then? I think so, Jen. I think so. So thank you all once again. You did a great job, Jen. Thank you very, very much.